Investing legend's warning of a once in a lifetime event. Now, when I say investing legend, I am talking about one of the most successful and best known investment advisors ever, who's accurately predicted five major events over the last 22 years. And what he tells us comes next in the stock market, bond market, and the real estate market is his biggest call yet. And it has massive influence over your retirement accounts, your house, and other investments. So in this video, I'm gonna break down who this legend is, what his legendary calls have been, what he is saying is heading our way right now, what stage we're in now, what the short and long-term factors are, and of course, how we should be looking to protect ourselves. So let's go. All right, welcome back. You know, one of my favorite things to do that's really helped my career grow really fast, my investments to go really fast, is something that says success leaves clues. So you find other people who are successful, you do about the same things they've done, and you should get about the same results. And so I like to look at other successful people. I, look to, I like to look at some of the most successful investors in the world, see what they've done and also what they're saying. And that's what we're gonna look at today. We're gonna look at one of the most successful investors and what he's saying. I am talking about Jeremy Grantham. Now I get it, he may not be you know, the household name like Warren Buffett or maybe a Ray Dalio because he's not on this giant media tour, uh, but in the investing world, he is a legend. Why? Why is he a legend? Well. As I like to say over and over, well, everybody says, no one can time a market. We know the bottom or top when we look backwards. However, Jeremy Grantham has done pretty well at calling some of the biggest bubbles in history, including accurately calling the Japanese bubble in 1989, calling the tech bubble in the year 2000, calling out the subprime lending bubble in the year 2008, calling out the melt up that we had both after the 2008 crash in 2009 and the melt up we had in 2018. So to have someone, a legend who's been around publicly saying this stuff for this long, it's somebody we should pay attention to. So what is he saying today? Well, what's he saying is what's next. And so this is where things start to get pretty crazy. He's calling out the biggest move, the biggest movement in his whole career. He's calling it the super bubble and he's actually calling it the super bubbles final act. What does that mean, the final act? Well, this is a once in a lifetime event, something that we'll probably never see again in our lifetime. What does that mean? Well, he's talking about a bubble bursting. Of course, we're talking about the markets crashing, your retirement accounts, your uh, real estate, et cetera. He's calling this bursting. And he says, in his opinion, of course, he believes it's gonna take out the stocks, it's gonna take out the bonds, and it's going to take out real estate. Now he is saying that this super bubble, as he's calling it, this will be only the fourth time it's happened in all of US history. It's a very rare event, one that none of us have lived through before. And this is what he's talking about. And his quote, prepare for an epic battle. Sounds pretty heavy. Sounds like we should be paying attention and we definitely are. So let's break down and see what he's talking about with this super bubble. All right, first of all, you have to understand that there's stages. Now, I like to say that everything's a bubble. Everyone's like, oh, real estate's a bubble, housing's a bubble, stocks are a bubble, or Bitcoin's a bubble. Yes, every single thing is a bubble. What stage of the bubble are we in is the question. So is the bubble just forming? Is the bubble getting kind of peaky? Is the bubble very toppy? And what stage are we in the bubble? So he breaks it down the four stages. So first, the bubble forms. Obviously, people start going into any kind of investment. Money starts kind of building up. The assets start to swell. The bubble forms. Second, a setback occurs. So markets stop going up when there's no more buyers. So people rush to the market in 2002, three, four, five. Everyone's rushing to real estate. And as more people rush to real estate, the faster real estate went up. The faster real estate up, the more people came to real estate, the more it went up. And it's like this cycle. And eventually it stops going up when there's no more buyers. It had sucked in all the buyers there were, or we can look at any market, the tech stock bubble, et cetera and that setback occurs, that's a half step. Then the third is a bear market rally, that's also a half step. And then fourth, the fundamentals and the markets crash. Now let me show you a visual of where we're at. I have uh, used this chart many times, I always like to refer back to it. So here's the stages he's talking about. So stage one, it goes up. 
Everybody's coming in. Optimism, this is awesome. Belief, wow, this is, has a long time. Thrill, oh, I've, this is amazing. Euphoria, I can't believe how much money we're making. It goes up. Then there's a setback. This is what he's talking about. So here, the market drops right here, okay? That's the second, a setback. Third, the third stage is this bear market rally, which is this right here. You get this retrace. We're gonna break it down into some actual ones. I'm gonna show you in a second, but I just wanna illustrate this. And then finally, it drops down. This is the fourth that he's talking about right here. So let's look at it in terms of some actual real markets that we have here. Now, these are um, ones, these are historical, all right? That's why we're gonna pull these out. So uh, what we like to do is we like to look at what's called fractals. And so we go, well, when we saw this pattern play out here, it's probably gonna play out similar to here and here. So history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. And so we go, well, when this happened, then it probably will happen again like this and this. So if I touch this and burn myself and I touch it again, I'll probably burn myself again. So let's break down some of these here. So here's 1929. Of course, we're talking about the Great Depression. This was the big one. And this is the S&P 500 in, um, in uh, November of 1930 to April. Well, it started in August of 29. So we see, again, the market went up, all right? It ran out of buyers and it crashed down to this red arrow here, and then it had this bear market rally. So from August 1929 to November 1930, it crashed, and then it bounced into April 1930. So the market rallied 46% in this bear market rally before it inevitably crashed all the way down. This entire gray period here is the, known as the Great Depression. So this is a 55% recovery from the peak. So you have the initial crash, you have the bear market rally, and then you have the drop. Now we saw the same thing in 1973 at the S&P 500. You'll notice the exact same pattern playing out again. So the market rallies, we have the setback, the market crashes to right here. You have about a 50, in this case, a 59% rally, a 60% rally. This is called the bear market rally, and then the inevitable crash down. You notice a pattern here. Let's keep going. Let's look at some more patterns so you can recognize them. Here we have the NASDAQ bubble. This is the tech stock bubble in 2000. So the market went up. You have this initial crash. This is the setback he's talking about. You have the bear market rally right here. It rallied 60% back, so about a 50 to 60% retracement of the first crash. So the first crash, a 50 to 60% retracement, and then the big plunge down. Are you starting to notice a trend? Okay, good. Notice this was exactly like the Wall Street cheat sheet that we looked at. Now, now that we understand that, where are we today? So this is what he's talking about today, so you can see the S&P 500, here's the March of 2020 crash. We've had this massive rally, all right? Now we've had, we've had this initial crash, and now we've had a 50% retrace right here, and now he's expecting another big crash. Are you noticing the pattern here? It's what we've been looking at. Now this one's spread out a little bit further, so it might look a little bit different. It depends on the time frame that the charts are. But you notice this is the same repeatable pattern that we have right now. Okay, now Grantham expects another 50% fall from here. He says, quote unquote, at least. It's pretty serious. 50% drop from here. Now, I'm not saying this is gonna happen. As a matter of fact, there's plenty of other people who say it won't. But let's look at why he says this is gonna happen. You need to understand this so you can figure this out for yourself, where your own convictions are. So why? Why is this gonna happen? Well, the near term. Remember, stage four was the fundamentals cause it to fall further. That's what we have to understand. What are the fundamentals he's looking at? So he says near term, we have massive problems with food. Globally, we have a massive problem with food. Uh, the war with Russia, Ukraine has disrupted 30 to 40% of grain exports around the world. Emerging markets potentially could be starving to death. The UN says almost a billion people are potentially gonna starve. It's a big problem. Obviously, we have massive fertilizer problems. Um, China doesn't wanna export fertilizer. Russia, Ukraine disrupted fertilizer problems. Of course, without fertilizer, we can't grow food. Uh, energy problems, I don't need to talk about that. I talk about that all the time. Uh, not just in the United States with the price of energy going through the roof, but in Europe, they're having serious energy problems, China as well. Of course, he singles them out, the European energy shock, which is threatening to break apart the European Union, break apart NATO, and even more importantly, it's deindustrializing them to shut down manufacturing, which is pushing down 
their ability to continue to stimulate or grow the market. So when the markets aren't growing, they're shrinking. And so this is a massive, massive, massive indicator as to why he thinks the fundamentals will drag this down. Also, China. So China has carried all the growth in the global GDP since the 2008 Great Financial Crash. China has been on this massive path to bring people from the farms into the cities. They've been building ghost cities, ghost towns. They've been building high-speed trains. They've been all build, building all this, which has put massive demand on all the commodities, on concrete, on steel, on, uh, on sand, on uh, oil, gas, you name it. So they've carried all the growth, but the problem is now China's in serious, serious trouble. As a matter of fact, I'm working on a video to break this down for you, but China has a serious problem with demographics. Their people are getting too old. They don't have enough young people. They have a serious problem with debt. Their debt is so high, all their institutions are failing. Real estate market's about to drag the whole country down. They have this uh, train issue with over a trillion dollars of debt that's blowing up. The banks are running out of money. They have tanks protecting them from the people. They are in serious pr problems. And so uh, I, I'm not going <laughs> to, I'll do a separate video on China if you want. You can leave me a comment down below. Oh, while you're at it, if you like this video, go ahead and click thumbs up on it too. Uh, but the point is, if China's in trouble, how do they carry the globe, right? If they're not buying all these materials, who's exporting them and what happens to them? We also have US excise tax on stock buybacks. So some of the biggest growth um, catalyst for the stock market in the US has been companies buying back their own shares, which goes all the way back to a law that Bill Clinton put in, pay, in place that changed the way stocks and uh, options go to CEOs and founders. And now the US wants to change this. They want to put an excess tax on the stock buybacks. Stock buybacks, if that happens, and companies buy less stock buybacks, but that's been the catalyst for all the growth, then what happens, oh, we get less growth. You're starting to see this. And then also, this is something super scary I've been talking about for about a year, price fixing. We're starting to see the governments in the United States throughout Europe, now talking about price fixing, setting the cap on prices, nationalization. I've been talking about in other videos how Biden's been talking about nationalization of industries. We're actually seeing it happen in Europe right now today, in Germany has just taken over three companies, um, and antitrust, which is breaking apart these corporations. All of these are very, very bad for business, which then means bad for stock prices, which means bad for growth, which Yes, these are near-term fundamentals of why he thinks the market continued dropping down. Okay, what about longer-term fundamentals? So I talked about demographics. Globally, we have a demographic problem. I talk about depopulation, people don't understand what that means. I'm just talking about demographics. People just, in developed nations, we just haven't had enough babies. That's just it. So now we have this aging population at the top, like an upside down pyramid, you have this big sections of population here, but below them you don't have enough people coming up, so workers are in short supply. We also have a long-term problem with central bank intervention. They have been increasing the monetary supply, but they can't continue to do that in this inflationary environment that we have today. The resources. We have a problem with resources, we're talking about commodities, and we have an unavoidable commodity squeeze happening, unavoidable. So what does that mean? The world still needs real things. We still need food, we still need energy, we still need minerals, metals, we still need those things. The problem is that we have severely underinvested in those. And now we have an unavoidable squeeze because the world needs them, we haven't invested into them. It takes, it depends on the commodity, it could take three to seven years to bring it online. That's a problem. And then back to the food, Fertil fertilizers. This is a longer term one. So because of a shortage of fertilizers that we have and because of all the soil deterioration that we have, we have a serious problem on our hands. That's gonna take a long time to get worked out. All right, now, the epic finale, he's calling this. The epic finale. Um, I don't, like, I don't like that word because it's not something that's enjoyable that most people are going to want to have happen to him. He says that because of these dangerous mix of factors that we have and the fact that he believes stocks, commodities, and real estate are all overvalued. So we have all these serious, serious headwinds, bear market vibes, both long term and short term. And we also have a problem where all of these assets have been overvalued because of what he's calling the super bubble. Then he says that the inflation numbers that we have, the highest we've had in over 40 years, and the rate shocks, 
because now the Fed and, and the central banks around the world, but the Federal Reserve in the U.S. has been raising rates so fast at a rate we haven't ever seen before. So between the inflation and the rate shocks, we kind of have this um, situation going back to 1970, which I showed you the chart that we used as one of those super bubble explanations. We also have a commodity situation on our hands which I've already broken down and the energy surge. So again, we have this shortage of energy, but we have this massive demand for energy. Again, back to similar to the 1970s. On top of that, we have confidence and sentiment at historic lows. As a matter of fact, the University of Michigan is probably the best um, run sentiment survey. They've been doing it since the 80s. Sentiment, the way people feel about the market, the optimism that they have in the market is at the lowest level ever in history since they've been doing that gauge. And we can see that the tech sectors are massively slowing. Why is this important? I think they've laid off over 80,000 workers. It's the fastest um, layoffs that we've ever seen in the tech sector. But well, the reason why is because if you look at the United States or really the world, all the growth in the last 20 years, not all of it, a good majority of the growth has come from the tech sector. What are the biggest, uh, what are the biggest stocks in the market today? The FANGs, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, the tech stocks. If the tech stocks are slowing big time and that falls, but that's been the catalyst that's been driving the markets forward, then what happens? You get it. It all leads to this epic finale. All right, so historical lessons, historical lessons. History rhymes. It doesn't always repeat exactly. Every cycle is a little bit different. So just because it's starting to look exactly like the other cycles that crash doesn't mean that it will. He believes it will. It doesn't mean that it will. But each cycle is different. As you've seen, they could retrace 50%. They could retrace, retrace 60%. So it's a little bit different. But and we also know that the government response is unpredictable. Will the Fed pivot? Will they jump in? Will they pump the markets back up? Or are they going to save the dollar and let the markets crash? Their response is unpredictable. Few of these events follow the rules. So what should you and I be doing? Well, you got to figure out, do you think he is correct? Or do you think the market will continue to go up from here? You got to figure out where you think on that first. Second of all, um, regardless of how you see that, then you need to have maximum safety. So what does that mean? One, build up your cash pillars. I like to have at least 30% cash on hand. Some people that I know want to have 50, even up to 80% cash. You want to have that cash because one, it removes your risk, your exposure to the markets, and two, you have opportunities for when this crash actually comes, you can have the sell of a lifetime right here. So build up your cash positions, reduce your exposure to these assets, um, and tread carefully. That's what you want to do. Hopefully that makes sense. Let me know what you think. Give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. If you don't, you can give me a thumbs down. That's okay. But at least tell me why in the comments down below. While you're at it, hit that subscribe button so you know when I put new videos out. And that's what I got to your success. I'm out.